If there is no will, you have to invent the way. Have I got your attention? Well, that's this week on Motoring 2004. SN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. The other day I was at a friend's cottage and I noticed that each morning a woodpecker would drop by and beat its head furiously against the same tree every morning and not seem to make any headway. And I thought to myself, even us human beings feel that way from time to time. And I think we can add car companies to that list too. I mean, take Honda and Toyota. They have been spending millions of dollars on hybrid technology that nobody seems to want. The Honda Insight and the Civic Hybrid have been poor in the sales showroom to say the least. And as for Toyota, the Prius has sold a grand total of a thousand cars since it was first launched in Canada in 2001. Well, the biggest buyers of the Prius are Californians, so it seems only apt that we're in California this week to check out the new and improved Toyota Prius and also ask the question that everybody's asking. Why would these companies spend so much time and so much money on a technology that nobody seems to want. I guess like our chief engineer has said, we do it because we must. It's what consumers, governments, we in the industry expect of ourselves. And also because we can, because Toyota has that technology in-house that it's developed and is now rolling out across a number of different platforms. And, and because it is going to serve as the technology on which our future fuel cell vehicles will be built. Given the environmental issues that uh, the world's facing today, given the growth of, uh, of the use of private transportation around the world, if we want to be in the, in the car industry in the years ahead, we're going to be there because we have a more environmentally friendly solution. Hybrid, as we refer to it in a powertrain system, is a system that has more than two energy stores or power, power sources in the vehicle. That could be gasoline and electric, as our vehicle is, or it could perhaps someday be diesel and electric, or maybe someday fuel cell and electric. Our vehicle works by using the gasoline engine and the electric motor in their respective most efficient operating zones. Our vehicle is, has the ability to run on gasoline only on electric only or on a combination of both gas and electric. Some of the competitor vehicles lack the ability to run electric only but run a combination of gas and electric or gasoline only. The first time I drove a Prius was the original prototype from Japan. I mean that the brakes were terrible. The car handled like a brick and it was different than maybe uh, something uh, of a futuristic nature but the, the first generation was okay. With that first generation vehicle, it really was a, a proof of concept, proof of technology, and the buyers were the people who were very committed to, uh, to making an environmental statement and, and dealing with the emissions, uh, but also the early adopters of new technology. Uh, this second generation car, we believe, is going to be part of that early majority. The people who uh, you know, maybe need to know that hybrid technology is there, but it's not going to be the, the, uh, the, the predominant uh, factor in making a choice for them. We also have to make sure that we're, we're true to you know, what, what makes a car fun to drive, what's attractive to a consumer. And the first generation Prius proved the technology. The second generation Prius uh, speaks to all those qualities that, uh, that make people want to get behind the wheel and drive. This one I really like, they did, they did a good job. There's still room for improvement, but uh, it's a car that people could drive on a daily basis without any problem. Uh, the handling is okay. The other alternative is the uh, Honda Civic Hybrid, and it's a close match, but the Toyota offers more sophistication uh, for the money, so I would go for the Prius. Uh, also, it looks better. 
based upon the, the EPA test cycles, the U.S. EPA test cycles, which are the same ones that define fuel economy for the Canadian market, the vehicle will be about 50% more economical on the highway, about 150% more economical in the city. Now, it's more than 100% more efficient than the best midsize car. It's 130% more efficient than the average new 2003 midsize car. It's significantly more efficient. We think ultimately as we're going forward, being an environmentally friendly vehicle is going to be one of those qualities that consumers expect in the same way they expect safety or quality. But you know, before safety was not selling, and now as safety sells, so maybe uh, two, three years from now, uh, ecology will sell. You can just guess, can't you? More later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, test driving cars isn't all it's cracked up to be. You have to start impossibly early, work long hours, and at the end of it, well, you have to evaluate a car I may not even like. But you know, sometimes it's all worthwhile. This week, it's the Viper. They say there's no substitute for cubic inches when it comes to developing raw, unadulterated power, and the Viper proves the point. Simply an 8.3-litre V10 engine negates the need for much of the fancy engineering employed in other ultra-high output designs. Rather than overhead cams and fanciful intakes, this lump relies on a two-valve per cylinder pushrod motor to deliver its 500 stampeding horses. Add to that an earth-shattering 525 pounds-feet of torque at 4200 RPM and the result must be experienced to be truly appreciated. Reading the numbers sends a shiver up your spine, strap yourself in, crank the engine to life and that shiver becomes reality as the tiny hairs on the back of your neck bristle as you walk towards a ton in four seconds. You know, you don't so much get into the Viper as you do fall in, but once you get behind the wheel it's well worth the effort. The seats are fabulous and the pedals and steering wheel are no longer offset as they used to be in the previous car. When you get to the gauges, well, they're now clear and concise, meaning you can read them even at the alarming speeds this car's capable of. There are, however, two drawbacks, and both of them have to do with heat. The first one, the heat generated by the engine and transmission when you start driving this car, well, it radiates back in through the central tunnel and up through the gear shift lever. It's enough, in fact, that even on a relatively cool day, you've got to leave the air conditioning turned on. The second place that heat's an issue, well, it has to do with the side pipes. As this warning label says, this sill plate gets very hot. Now, whilst it won't burn you, it sure does get your attention as you climb out. Matched with the motor is a six-speed manual box that is remarkably refined. The throws are short, the gate well defined, and unlike most in this league, it does not take both feet to depress the clutch. As a result, it is entirely possible to drive the Viper in a civilized manner despite the horsepower. From here, the power is relayed to the road through a limited slip diff and a truly massive set of tires. 275 3518s up front and 345 30 ZR19s in back. You know, one of the biggest improvements to this new Viper is to the brake system. It takes 500 horsepower, eight and a half seconds to get this thing up to 160 kilometers an hour. It takes less than four and a half to get it back to rest. That means this thing's got some of the best binders the world has to offer. Reaching this level of performance was not easy. Given the tremendous speeds at play, the engineers asked the supplier how the anti-lock brakes would react when hammered at 320 kilometers an hour. The answer the team received was short and sweet. Dunno, we've never tried it. So Dodge tested the system at 270K. Initially, it was a hair-raising experience. However, repeated tweaking brought the system to where it is today. 
The lone complaint is that the brakes are not incorporated into some sort of electronic traction control system. Of all of the design changes made to this 2004 Viper, it was the hood of all things that caused the most head scratching, and it boils down to one simple fact. The old car had a clamshell. That meant that the two front fenders and the hood were all molded out of one single sheet. Now what they decided to do was to make sure they didn't get it wrong was ask the owner body. And they turned around and said, you know what, we don't give a darn as long as it gets better brakes and more horsepower, which this car does. The reason that this is such a significant change, the old clamshell, well it would have cost you 12,000 US dollars to replace it. You can replace both front fenders and the hood for about 25% of the cost. Beneath the composite body, the Viper starts life as a rather bare-bone steel butt to which everything else is bolted. First up is a fully independent double wishbone suspension and rack and pinion steering system. Through the pylons, the Viper showed the composure of a past master. The turn-in afforded by the steering and tyres is razor sharp, and so it thankfully obeys driver input very quickly. Indeed, without this endearing trait, you would not have much of a fighting chance of catching the rear end whenever it disappeared on you. You know, the brakes and engine on this new Viper are simply stupendous. And anybody that underestimates horsepower, well, they have not driven this car. It really does make you wonder how much horsepower really is enough. When you see my performance rating at the end of the show, well, you'll see a maximum five. You should be thinking more like 10. Our Midas tip of the week concerns replacing cooling system hoses. Whether it's a rad hose or a heater hose, in most cases the hose itself is an inexpensive part. But the part that it connects to, the radiator, the heater core, or other components in your cooling system, is usually fragile, expensive, and in many cases hard to get out. So if you damage it, it could be really costly. I want to show you what can happen. Now this radiator came out of a Honda Civic all-wheel drive station wagon with air conditioning. It's a rather expensive rad that appears to be only available from the dealer for $625. Now this rad was otherwise quite serviceable, but the owner of the car was faced with having to replace a blown rad hose on the side of the road. It looks like somebody replaced this upper rad hose and when they were trying to get the old one off, they used a screwdriver to try and pry it loose, breaking a big hunk out of the upper rad hose nipple. Now, what a mechanic would do if he was working in the shop is use a hose loosening device like this one that slips in behind the hose and then you can wriggle it around in a circle till it breaks the adhesion between the two. If you don't have that tool, you can also try and rotate the hose to break the adhesion loose. Now, if, you're, if that still won't work, you can take a utility knife and split the hose or cut the hose very carefully and then separate it, peel it apart with your fingertips to loosen it. You've got to be very careful with these components. They're fragile and it's easy to do damage like this if you're not careful. That's your Midas tip of the week. took a look at the Chrysler Intrepid, uh, we realized that the 3.5 uh, high output engine gave us the ability to come with the fastest production car vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Crown Victoria or Impala. We had the handling capabilities, we basically had the package that would meet the requirements of the government and police agencies across Canada. And ultimately here we are today with our 2003 Chrysler Intrepid uh, police cruiser. It has the turn-in characteristics of a front-wheel drive car and the mid-corner and kind of corner exit uh, characteristics of a rear-wheel drive car, which is, is not, I, I personally haven't experienced a front-wheel drive car like it before. Um, I know the cab forward design and the way that the car is set up uh, in terms of its balance has a lot to do with that. Um, but uh, I have to say I am thoroughly impressed uh, with the Intrepid. The research that we did with the police uh, was hands-on. Uh, we went out there and the feedback that we got 
is number one uh, priority for themselves was handling. Common sense suggests that the best way to avoid an accident is to have the handling and maneuverable uh, ability of the vehicle to avoid a, a difficult situation. Uh, so that was number one feedback. Then they came back and said speed was very critical to them. And again, our 3.5 liter engine producing 244 horsepower gives us the fastest car out there compared to Crown Victoria and, and Impala. For some of those bad guys out there that uh, decide they don't want to abide by the law, I'll tell you one thing, uh, they're going to have a real tough time uh, with this car. It really is uh, an incredible car and like I said, it's, it's been designed to really uh, make it easy for all the officers and all the other services that are going to use this car um, to be able to drive it fairly aggressively and, and really uh, feel confident behind the wheel that they are uh, in a car which is, does pretty much everything they ask of it. Earlier we heard how Toyota is having a tough time selling its Prius Hybrid and they're hoping of course the 2004 model will change things. But you know, something happened today that I think really illustrates the company's problem. You see, a lady walked out to me and said, is that a Prius? I said, yes. She said, everybody should be driving one of those and therein lies the problem. Everybody wants to save the environment, but... Anyway, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and let's ask Bill Gardner what he thinks of the hybrid technology and its future. Brad, I think these hybrid cars are great. You know, when you think about the way most people use a vehicle, light duty transportation for one or two passengers and little or no cargo weight, a hybrid is certainly going to do the trick. And what is there not to like about 70 or 80 miles per gallon? Now, you all know how much I love my pickup trucks, but certainly fuel mileage is not their forte. Now I just got back on a, from a trip down to the States, I put 5,500 kilometers on our long-term test Tundra inside of 10 days, so I got some real good driving experiences with the Tundra. It's giving me a range of about 700 kilometers on its 100 liter tank, so I'm getting fuel mileage of around 21 and 3 quarters to 23 and a half miles per imperial gallon. Now when you do a trip through the States, you've got to make sure that you take your calculator and convert the US, smaller US gallon to imperial gallons before you make your calculations. In terms of liters per uh, 100 kilometers, I'm getting between 12 and 13 liters per 100 kilometers in terms of highway fuel mileage. So that's pretty good for a V8 truck with the kind of power that this vehicle's got. I'm sitting at about 14,500 kilometers. All it's needed so far is one oil change at, at 8,000 kilometers, an oil filter, and a grease job. Uh, the engine has not used any oil whatsoever in terms of oil consumption. There's been little or no consumption. Now the Tundra's got great power, 245 horsepower and tons of low end torque. So driving it through the mountains in the States was absolutely fantastic. It goes up those grades like they're not even there and that's where you really notice the difference in engine power. Now I've only driven a hybrid car around the city so I don't know what it would be like driving in the mountains. I know the acceleration off the line is great because of the assist with the electric motor but I'm wondering at highway speeds when you get to some serious grades I think that's where a hybrid might be uh, in, in a bit of trouble. When you've got the kind of muscle you've got with a V8 though you get through the mountains in a hurry they're absolutely a, a pleasure to drive. Now uh, it's, it's interesting to uh, pick up one of these uh, little slide rules that you can get from Natural Resources Canada and track your fuel mileage. If you've got a hybrid car, boy, you're going to be smiling when you get the numbers. But this little slide rule allows you to check your mileage out. You just move the, uh, the slide part along for liters of fuel per uh, kilometers traveled and you get a readout in miles per gallon or liters per hundred kilometers. It's kind of an interesting game to play. There's some neat little tips on improving your fuel mileage and make sure you take your calculator with you so you can make all the conversions. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. There's a lot of talk these days about hybrid cars. Now these are cars that run on gasoline until they sense guilt on the part of the owner. Then they switch to battery power. Well, I'm just kidding. Actually, hybrid cars store the energy that's otherwise lost in gasoline engines in a battery. Then they use that power to work an electric motor to help propel the vehicle. The key deal is you don't plug a hybrid in. They're totally self-contained. Now a recent American research study indicated that hybrids are even more environmentally friendly 
than pure hydrogen fuel cell cars. And that's because the processes required to make hydrogen are not as green as they should be, like my shirt. The problem with hybrids, they're not worth it. The Honda Civic, for example, great car to drive, but it costs something like $7,000 more than a comparable gasoline Civic. And with the fuel you'll save, it'll pay for itself in 28 years. In other words, you're not going to buy this because it makes sense, but because it makes you feel good. The original Prius, well, it was kind of a Tercel-sized car for a Camry-sized price, and Canadians are gonna, aren't going to buy that no matter how good the fuel economy is. The new Prius, well, that's a different story. It's a very nearly Camry-sized car for a Camry-sized price that happens to get 60 miles per gallon. I think they'll do pretty well with that. But the biggest problem with any of these is that they're starting with vehicles that are already pretty fuel efficient. General Motors will be taking a different tack. They're going to apply hybrid technology to their full-size pickup trucks and SUVs. These are the worst vehicles in their fleet, so even a small percentage improvement will result in large numbers of liters of fuel saved. Now, we don't want the, what the economics of these things are going to be yet. They'll be introduced sometime in the next year. But one thing you can be sure of, over the next five or six years, you're going to have a lot of very interesting hybrid alternatives available to you. But wait, should you hold on for a pure hydrogen fuel cell car? Well, everybody, including me, thinks hydrogen's the long-term answer. But we're not going to see hydrogen cars until there's a hydrogen filling station on every street corner. Now, I'm not telling you to sell your Ballard stock just yet, but I am telling you, don't hold your breath. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, the 2004 Toyota Prius is not only a treat to drive, but with 300 patents, it's also a technological wonder. And you know, in a future test drive, Graham will take a look at the highlights. But you know, we should all be pleased that companies like Toyota continue to invest in this technology. As the chief engineer of the Prius told me, if you can do it, you must do it. So there you go. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. It prepares the students for their chosen career path. We're all here for one reason. We love business, we love people, and we love automobiles. It prepares them for what they want to do for their career choice. No sales environment. The students are straight up. They'll tell you uh, what's hot, what's not, what exactly is going on in the automotive industry. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that.